folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Last time we were together on this subject, if you remember, I showed you some videos, pretty creepy videos, of what I believe were some type of familiar spirit, unclean spirit, evil spirit, devils, you, uh, poltergeist, ghost, haunts, boogers. You, yeah, people down south, they call them boogers. But anyway, uh, I showed you some videos of that, and they were pretty creepy, I have to tell you. It seems to be an association with between those pale-faced spirits, devils, uh, and, and death, all right? Well, we're going to take it up a notch. I've got a couple of videos that uh, they were put together like they were a part of the same video, but there's differences in the creature that you're about to see. And I'm going to give you the same warning as I did the last time. I'm going to show some videos and maybe, and I got a few uh, pictures as well, photographs. Uh, viewer discretion is definitely advised before, uh, before you let your children see it before you let your, your wife, see, wife see it, some of you, before you let your husband see it. Anyway, um, this creature here freaks me out. Take a look at the first video that I'm going to show you. You see uh, some kind of creature walking from left to right on the screen uh, it takes a while for your mind to really understand what's happening here. But this is a video of a humanoid type. Let's say it's, let's say it's a spirit, just for argument's sake. It is bent completely over backwards and it's walking with its head pointed downward walking on its feet and its hands. Now, it took me a while to figure out what I was looking at because I can tell you, you know, I've seen, you know, a few people, mainly, uh, you know, like teenage girls, they're, you know, very limber, you know, they're still, they're coming out of childhood and they can bend over backwards and, and stand basically with feet on the ground and hands on the ground, you know, hair hanging down, head upside down, all right? I've never seen anybody, whether it was, uh, uh, you know, somebody right in front of me or <laughs> Cirque du Soleil or P.T. Barnum, I've never seen anybody walk bent completely over backwards head hanging straight down, pointed straight down to the ground, hair dragging the ground, and then walking any kind of distance whatsoever. I have never seen that. I don't think that it's possible. I don't think it's possible. Now that's one clip. I'm gonna show you the clip that was attached to it. Uh, somebody figured that maybe they were watching one and the same thing, but what you'll see is this next one here um, whether it's a male or female spirit, it, it, there's no way to tell, but it has, it has pants on. This one does. The, the previous one, go back and look at it just for a second. You can tell it's sort of wearing a skirt or a dress or a kilt. Who knows? But now this one is really going to freak you out. Again, viewer discretion. We're going to see the same type of motion, the same stance, as it were. Some kind of creature that has the pale face, dark eyes, dark lips, dark black, long black hair. Doing what I call the night crawl. Take a look. You can see it coming out of the shadows. And somebody sped the video up. I understand that because it takes a while, but I want you to look at the length at which this creature has to walk. And it just, when you start, when you really start seeing the face and the eyes and the hair, 
And the fact that whatever this creature is can walk any sort of distance whatsoever, um, seemingly with very little effort. Again, you know, I've seen people bend over backwards like that. I've never seen anybody walk that way. This, this definitely, it puts it in the category of supernatural. And if I go with the precise definition of that, super means beyond and above. Um, natural means the natural state of things, the way bunnies hop, the way kangaroos jump, the way men walk and women, um, the way spiders crawl. We all recognize how they do their things and when we see them do it, we believe that it's natural because that's what they do. However, this goes beyond natural. It is not, I don't know of any creature in the earth that turns around upside down and reverses itself and walks that way. I, I don't know of any creature that can do that. So I believe that definitely we're dealing with something above and beyond what is natural. And then if I apply the rest of the meaning to the word supernatural, we're dealing with something that is beyond uh, beyond human, beyond what nature, what God has created in this world to be natural, it goes well beyond that into the, um, I would have to say inside, into the spiritual, um, the spiritual realm. We find the spiritual realm listed for us by category in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 has been probably one of the, one of the passages that I've studied, man, I don't know how many different videos, different teachings, um, doctrines are, are based right here uh, on this one verse. And, and what Paul told us was our, this is what we're really fighting in this world today. We're fighting against spirits, not flesh and blood. This is not a human war. This is a war against spirits. And as such, when you fight spirits, you can't fight them with bullets and bayonets and bombs and things like that, you can't do it. Our weapons of warfare, warfare are not carnal, the Bible says. They're spiritual. So spiritual war means we use spiritual weapons. Number one weapon being the word of God. Number two weapon would be the bended knee, praying to God, asking God for help, asking God to protect you, to watch over you asking God to send angels on your behalf to help you fight. And I believe in that 100%. I believe in that. And I believe it's uh, talked about in scripture. But let's read Ephesians chapter six and look at these categories that pretty much all, I, I, or I would say all uh, evil spirits, familiar spirits, unclean spirits, devils, gods, you name it, ghosts, anything like that. These are the categories that they belong in. I should have done this a while ago. Ephesians 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. <clears throat> <clears throat> against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I would say that probably a lot of what we've seen so far would be spiritual wickedness. There's no doubt in my mind. When you look at uh, some of the devils that we have seen, like I mentioned the pale face ones, those are just, that just looks wicked. It looks evil. And again, I'm going to say this. Um, when I see spirits like this, assuming that the videos that we've seen are not manufactured videos that they're real and i believe that 
you know, there's always going to be some fakes out there. That, that's the nature of things. People think they can fake videos and get more likes on whatever platform they're on. I couldn't care less about how many likes or dislikes are on my channel or how we, how we present ourselves. The only thing I'm concerned with is sticking right to the Word of God. And some people just don't like that. So anyway, uh, but there's no doubt in my mind that the, um, the videos, that what, the one we just saw today, ones we saw in previous uh, two videos dealing with this subject, that they would fall probably under the category of spiritual wickedness. They just look wicked. And, and I do believe that there, it's possible that there is a connection between those who, um, and I started seeing this in the 90s, and maybe I'm a little bit behind, I probably am, but uh, I started seeing a lot of this in the early 90s, mid-90s. Uh, we had a young lady that went to our Christian school back in those days, and uh, just very sweet young lady, and um, she uh, dropped out of our school, went to public school. Uh, she came back to visit, and her parents were th thinking about putting her back into our school because she had changed. Oh, yeah, she changed. She was like b this big, long, black, baggy pants, black eyebrows, black eyeshadow, um, black fingernails, black leather boots, black shirt with, I don't remember what was on it, um, black hair, and she used to have sort of a light brown hair. And I'm just like, what in the world? I mean, I, I've seen people fall for fads, but to go after something like that, and then you, you realize that she has associated herself with what's called, or what was called then, death metal. It's a style of rock and roll music. It's very macabre, very, very wicked, and it's always geared toward death and devils and demons and shadows and evil and you know, things like that. Um, and that's what I believe the spirit that is involved in turning young people, even some adults, over in to want to dress like that, to want to look like that, to be part of that style. I believe that the spirits that we're seeing in these videos are spirits that are influencing these young people. And do spirits influence people? Absolutely. The devil was a spirit in the form of a serpent when he went to Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he spoke his words to her, never one time telling her that she needs to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He never, never, ever said you need to eat that. All he did was tell her that God lied. You shall not surely die. God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be his gods. And so he never once told her, you have to eat this. Her lust just took over and that's exactly what she did. But he was a spirit having influence over a human being. And that's how it works. The devil is a deceiver. He is called the tempter in the Bible. And so I believe that when you see things like that, that are displayed in the physical realm, in the human world, there is a spirit, there is a spirit that is behind it all. And it doesn't matter if it's death metal and everybody's wearing black, or if it's the way that, uh, rap music, whether sung by white people or black people, it doesn't matter. That rap music going out there, uh, with themes of, uh, absolute anarchy, which means no government whatsoever can rule over us. Um, hatred toward police officers, judges, those who are in authority. The Bible warns us about that. Um, saying some of the most vulgar things about women and about the marital act that I never believed in my lifetime I'd ever hear coming out of musicians. I mean, you know, I grew up in the 70s and it was uh, very subliminal how they talked about 
the things that husbands and wives do. But now it's blatant, it's open, it's those, it's basically pornography set to music. And I believe that there are spirits. Those spirits would definitely fall under the category of spiritual wickedness. Let's go back to reading this verse. Against, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That could be another possibility. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, I believe the Bible's telling us one, one of two things. Number one, an evil day comes when we are attacked by these spirits. That is an evil day. And I've had, to be honest with you, I've had my share of being attacked by evil spirits. And I don't like it. Um, but God allows it for a reason. What do you think God's trying to do? Like David said, he's teaching my hands to know warfare and he's teaching my fingers to fight. David was skilled with the sling and when Saul presented all of his armor and all of his weaponry to David, David said, I've, I've never tried any of that stuff. I'll just stick with what I know. Sling, bam. Goliath down on the ground, he went and cut his head off, all right? So I believe that uh, God definitely has helped me and taught me how to stand in an evil day when other people have fallen. But then I believe that there is coming a great, big, gigantic, evil day. And I believe that God's saints will withstand in that day because God will have made sure that we are spiritually prepared. Not physically, spiritually prepared. We will have our breastplate of righteousness, our helmet of salvation, uh, the shield of faith and so on. We will have those things and we will be ready. I believe God will make sure of it. And he's testing us now. To, not to show him how we're going to turn out. He already knows. He's testing us to show us where we are. And whenever I go through something, and it's a pretty bad ordeal, and I, sometimes I may not come out so good, I say, God, why, why did that happen? And I know the answer. God is saying, next time, Mike, you'll do better. And I just, I cry and say, amen, God, amen. All right, now, um, let me take you to one particular event. I mentioned this in, in, I think, one of the other videos. I know I brought this up before in recent videos where I've been talking about ghosts and poltergeist uh, situations and so on. And that is, uh, this one became famous. In fact, I didn't know this until today. I was doing just a little bit more research on what was called the Amityville Horror. This took place in a little township called Amityville, New York. And here's what's funny about, well, not funny, but just strange about it. Amityville, the word amity comes from the Latin word or the Greek word amor, which is the word for love, okay? And so I think it's Latin. But anyway, uh, in Spanish, you, you say amor. In French, you say amor. Anyway, that's what amity means. It's like a, a town of friendship. Well, here they are in Amityville, New York, and this family, um, the Lutz family, is running out of the front door, screaming bloody murder, getting out of that house because of all the things that had happened there. And uh, just briefly, and I didn't know this, I mentioned this a while ago, there has been 34, at least 34 motion pictures, movies made based upon this event that took place uh, somewhere around 1975, 1976, somewhere around in there. Uh, an author got a hold of the story and he listened to about 45 hours of the Lutz family tell their story, tell the details of what happened. But it all goes back to, uh, in 1974, a young man by the name of Ronald DeFeo 
um, for no reason at all, took a gun that was in the family house. He is about, I think he's like um, 23, 24 at the time, something like that. He systematically goes from room to room and he kills everybody living in his house. He killed, he shot and killed his own parents, shot them twice. All of the bodies were found with their laying face down. Then he killed his 18 year old sister, 13 year old sister, I think, 12 year old sibling, and the youngest was nine years old. Killed all four of his siblings, killed his parents. The next day, he shows up at a bar that he used to frequent, and he comes in and he says to one of the patrons in there that knows him, I think my family's dead. Weird, out of his mind. They go to his house, sure enough, call the police. They arrested um, Ronald DeFeo that night. They arrested him, charged him with murder, found him guilty. I found out he died in prison uh, in 2021. Uh, so, and never did. He never, according to him, never remembered killing anybody in his house, much less his own family. Didn't seem to be a whole lot of reason for him to kill his family. He just killed his family. You could say, well, maybe his mad at his dad for not giving him drug money. Okay, I, I can go along with that one. But why kill your little brother? Nine years old. Why kill him? But he just did. He just went and killed every member of his family. And I think it's very, very possible with his drug abuse, maybe whatever else was going on in his life. I think that a devil used him Remember what Jesus said about Satan? He's a murderer. And he was from the beginning. He's also a thief. But he is a murderer. The devil kills people or has people killed. Remember the instruction that God gave to Satan concerning Job. You can touch his body. You cannot kill him. Meaning that the devil has the power to take human life if he is allowed to do it. And in this case, the devil never even had to get his hands bloodied. He just went into and took over uh, the oldest son of this family, killed every one of them in that house. Now, the house goes up for sale. And they can't sell it at market price. And this is the 80s or the 70s, okay? So... Um, the house in that market back in the 70s would have been worth probably 150, 175, maybe $200,000. No way was anybody going to buy it until the Lutz family came along. And they bought the house somewhere around $80,000. They thought they had got the deal of the century. They moved everything in in that house and they began to live there. Immediately, they started noticing some very weird, um, I don't know how else to describe it, but events were happening in that house. At one point, um, Mr. Lutz, George, I think George Lutz, um, he was a non-practicing Methodist. His wife was a non-practicing Catholic, and they wanted a Catholic priest to come over and bless the house. It's the belief that you do this in front of a wall and the wall's blessed. That's, I don't know. But anyway, Catholic priest comes over. He's got holy water. Something about the water and the Pope doing this over the water. And now the water's holy. Hey, it's their religion, okay? But anyway... A priest comes over, he does this thing, he goes into the bed, what used to be the bedroom where uh, DeFeo's parents were murdered. He goes in that room, temperature's like 30 degrees inside there, he's freezing to death. It's cold outside, but it ain't that cold. 
He tries to bless this room, sprinkle holy water. He noticed there are flies everywhere in this room. Kathy Lutz, the wife, was going to turn this into a sewing room. Okay? As the, and, and when I think of the flies being in that room, I've heard this before about people thinking that certain rooms in their house have a spiritual presence or certain locations. And there's all these flies flying around everywhere. And it reminded me of who Baal was. The name Baal from the Old Testament means Lord of the Flies. What was one of the, um, um, the curses that God poured out to Egypt? One of the plagues that God poured out to Egypt it was the plague of flies, wasn't it? And Baal's name means Lord of the Flies. So in this one room... There's flies everywhere. By this time, George Lutz, every time he's in the house, he is freezing to death, no matter what room he's in. They were building fires in the fireplace. He would be sitting there next to the fire, multiple blankets covering him up. He could not get warmth from any place in that house. But anyway, the priest is in that sewing room and there's flies everywhere. And as he's trying to, quote unquote, bless the room, he hears in a very deep, dark growl, get out. So he walks out and he tells Kathy Lutz, keep the kids out of that sewing room, stay out of that room. No explanation, nothing, and he leaves. 28 days after the Lutz family moved in, here they come out the front door in the middle of the night, screaming bloody murder. They got into their station wagon, they drove off, and they never set foot in. They left all of their earthly belongings, they left their furniture, they left everything in that house, and they refused to go back. Not even for nothing. Their, their cigarettes, they were both heavy smokers. Not after their furniture, not after their clothes, nothing. Something I've... Now... Subsequent families have moved into that house and have never had a problem. So what, what do you think? What gives with that? Something I found out about George and Kathy Lutz both is that prior to this event happening in their lives, they both were people who learned the art of Eastern uh, Hindu meditation what I mean by that is what what used to be called back in the 70s transcendental meditation they were doing the same thing that Whitley Strieber who wrote the book communion about how aliens were coming down and taking him out of his cabin and taking him up to the ship and doing all kinds of awful things to him Whitley Strieber uh, was someone who meditated every day and when you meditate in that way you don't fill your mind with thoughts. You empty your mind of everything. God built into us this amazing brain and its consciousness. That means I am physically aware of everything going on around me. The lights are on. My hands are moving. I'm talking to a camera and so on and so on. But when you meditate according to the Eastern meditation guidelines, you empty your mind of everything. And thus, what you do is God put a brick firewall in your brain to protect your consciousness. Once you remove every thought, everything out of your mind, and it becomes this void, that's when a spirit moves in, or multiple ones. You basically opened the door and let them in. So the Lutzes were... They were basically getting, they didn't know this at the time, but they were in contact with familiar spirits. I don't know what voices they were hearing. I don't know what they were getting out of it. I just know that what they were doing was getting in contact with familiar spirits, which turned out for them to be evil spirits. Very evil spirits. Now, I said all that to say this. I've used this picture before. In fact, I showed it last week. This is 
a picture of John DeFeo. He's the nine-year-old little brother to Ronald DeFeo. There are striking similarities between this picture of little John DeFeo and the spirit that was captured on camera. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how that picture was taken. If you've seen or if you've heard of the Conjuring movie series, uh, subsequently you have the Annabelle series. Uh, you're looking at the life story and the research and the work of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now, I don't know how they got into being ghost busters, but during their lifetime, they were involved in, I'm going to say hundreds, if not over a thousand different um, house hauntings, uh, location hauntings, spirits, what they would refer to as demon possession cases, uh, situations where in the Annabelle, the whole Annabelle series is about, a, I think, a Raggedy Ann doll. And the thing apparently has a devil attached to it. And anybody who's got that doll, you say, Pastor, do you believe in all those things? Well, let me tell you yes, and I will show you why I believe what I believe. Is it possible for spirits to dwell inside of a house? Are there such things as haunted houses? Can things like dolls and things like that, can they uh, be possessed by a spirit of some kind? Can an, here we go, can an inanimate object suddenly change form into a animate object? Inanimate means not moving, not alive. Animated means it's alive and moving. Can that happen? And before you say no, I'm going to remind you of what happened in the book of Exodus when Aaron took Moses' rod, cast it to the ground, and the rod became a serpent. Hold on. That's what God did. But what happened right after that? The Bible says that Pharaoh's magicians used enchantments. Enchantments is one of the things of nine things in Deuteronomy 18 that God told the Israelites, don't do this. Don't be enchanters. Don't go after those who are, uh, who have familiar spirits. Don't go after wizards. Don't practice witchcraft. Enchantments was one of them. And these magicians of Pharaoh had their rods they gave out whatever enchantment it was that they gave, whatever magic spell it was that they said, but they were also able to turn their rods into living serpents. Now, I like how the story ends up because I think God dared them to do it. There's no doubt in my mind because it's like a foreshadow, okay? But anyway, here's, here's Aaron's rod, Moses' rod, and what ends up happening? Aaron's rod swallowed up all of Pharaoh's magician's snake rods. And now they're gone. I love that. Okay, listen. God has not given us the spirit of fear, people. There may come a time when you and I see some very evil supernatural things happen. Don't be afraid. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay? So anyway, the, back to the photograph. Uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren had a photographer by the name of Ed Campbell, and he set up a camera in the upstairs of this two-story house, and um, it was an infrared camera, and he put black and white film in it, and nobody's living in the house at this time. He set the camera up in there and let it sit all night. And he came back to check on it the next day. This is the picture that he found on that film. Now, you say, well, okay, Pastor Mike, what is this? Is this really the spirit of a little child? Um, 
And was it just there for like that one brief moment or did it possibly linger around in the house and so on? Well, let's answer some questions with Scripture. Let's answer the question of, number one, do spirits inhabit? Well, we've already settled the issue of do spirits inhabit people. That's already been settled. We talked about that in the first episode of this. Do evil spirits inhabit houses? Uh, any place where people would live? Do they inhabit forests? Deserts? Uh, certain parts of a city? Do they have power, let's say, over an entire nation? Well, that's the case. We know that's true. Remember the people of the prince of Persia, the prince of Persia himself withstood Gabriel from answering Daniel's prayer for 21 days. And the Bible specifically mentions him as being the, the prince over the people of Persia. So we know that that dominion, that principality spirit, rules over an entire area. But let's look at scriptures. Isaiah 13. This is a description of Babylon. Babylon herself, I believe, is a spirit, a spiritual entity in the form of a woman, a harlot woman. And her and her religion is going to be a universal religion. In other words, it's a religion that everybody will believe and does believe now in various forms, by various names. They have various names for the same God, but it's not the God that you and I serve, whose God this book belongs to. Amen? So, Isaiah chapter 13 tells us the, the burden of Babylon and the prophecy concerning Babylon and who or what dwells in Babylon. Isaiah 13, verse 19, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there. And notice this, their houses shall be full of doleful creatures and owls shall dwell there and satyrs shall dance there and the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and here it is dragons in their pleasant palaces and her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged now if we were to i won't take a lot of time with this because i gotta move on but in the language of the Bible, uh, if you just stick with the Word of God, people, God will make this so easy for you. I promise you He will. Okay? When I see birds mentioned like anywhere in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. I know what Jesus said concerning what birds represent in the Scriptures. Remember when Jesus in Matthew 13 was uh, telling the parable of um, the seed and the sower. And he said, the seed is the word of God. Amen. It's the good seed, the good word of God. And the sower sows it. And some of it, you know, falls outside of the garden area or falls outside of the field area. And what happens to it? In the parable, he says, the fowls of heaven come down and devour it. But when he gives the interpretation of it, he says, the devil. Or in another one, he says, the wicked one comes down and devours it. So right there, Jesus has, has tied these two ideas together. The fowls of the air and evil angels. And, and especially since um, if you take the list of unclean birds from the law, you'll note that all of those birds... They eat flesh. Hawks, eagles, vultures, owls. All of those represent evil angels. I mean, think about it. They fly in the air. Think about this. There are 
clean birds that God allowed them to eat. How did the Holy Spirit manifest itself when Jesus was baptized? As a bird, as a dove. And you'll never see doves on the side of the road picking maggots out of some possum or some armadillo, right? Okay, they eat seed of the Word of God. Mm. Anyway, so here we have mentioned um, owls. Um, we're going to see more later. Owls especially. Owls represent evil spirits. And I won't even get into all the places you can find owls everywhere, but I'm telling you there are evil spirits associated with owls. A lot of UFO stories that I've read, including a recent one written by a man by the name of Chris Bledsoe, who claims to be a born-again Christian. His whole UFO interaction began at a young age when he saw this humongous owl staring right at him, right at him, okay? But anyway... Uh, notice that you have wild beasts of the desert and they're, and they're lying in people's houses. Houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Doleful creatures like mourning. They make a mourning sound. Owls shall dwell there. Satyrs. My theory on that is part human, part hairy beast. Because the word sair, the Hebrew word sair, simply means hairy. And in one place in the King James... The word sair is translated as devils. Okay? Blue letter Bible, look it up. Uh, but you got wild beasts living in people's houses. These beasts are devils. Dragons, absolutely 100%. These dragons are devils and they're living in king's palaces. Okay? So is it possible? Yes, let's, we need another witness. Revelation 18. Verse 1, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and no, notice this, and a cage of every unclean and hateful, what? Bird. You know, there's a... Um, there's a, uh, what is it, a musical or a play um, called La Cage à Fowl, something that's French. It means the birdcage. And it's, it's about a couple of gay guys, right? Babylon itself is the dwelling place, the habitation of devils, foul spirits, unclean birds, and angry birds. Hmm. Re Isaiah 34, verse 11. Notice this. This is sort of like a, a passage that is connected to Isaiah 13. But the cormorant, that's a bird, and the bittern, a, it's a type of tern, shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall, again, these are all flesh-eating birds. The raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. In verse 14, the wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And again, we have the satyr. The satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. And there shall the vultures also be gathered Every one with her mate. What God is describing here is a, is a barren place, a wilderness. There are spiritual wildernesses. There are places that we get into in life and we find that there's, there's no bread, there's no water. And what I'm referring to is there's no bread coming down from heaven, the word of God isn't there, no water for our soul, again, a picture of the word of God. And so there can be churches, people's homes, people who claim to be religious, people who claim to be 
wonderful Christians. And yet, the spirit of Babylon could dwell there. And because Babylon despises the word of God and Babylon despises God's way of salvation, it's going to be something entirely different. It's going to be full of devils. So, so far, three verses. Isaiah 13, Revelation 18, Isaiah 34, all telling us in a literal fashion that houses, palaces, deserts, wildernesses, forests. Let me tell you a little bit about the Druids. The Druid priest, the Druid, Druid, Druidism was the only religion, pretty much, um, that existed in the Isle of Great Britain and where Ireland is now before Christianity came to it. And these Druid priests, they had power. The speculation is, was that uh, in the days of King Arthur, Merlin the magician was a Druid priest. And these priests, they usually did a lot of their all oh, their bonfires, their sacrifices, their rituals, and so on, centered upon an oak tree and almost always in a forest area. Now, why? Why did they have to go to a forest area? In fact, let me ask you this. Why did God, when he told like Josiah the king and Hezekiah and others, when God gave commandment through the word that they were supposed to tear down uh, all of the groves that they found in the land. Why not just take the idol that was in the grove? A grove would be like a, a plot where you, you planted little trees and bushes and flowers and vegetation of all kinds. And you put a statue, usually of the fertility goddess, uh, Ashtaroth is who the Israelites preferred to worship. And so her image would be in the midst of all these different trees and plants and everything. Everything that was green uh, was there. Why didn't God just say, get the idols out of those trees or out of that, out of that little place there where all those plants are and, and break the idols down? Why did God say that they had to tear down the groves? When you go into the woods, oh, I'll never forget, deer season one year, years ago, and I'm walking in the dark to my deer stand. And all of a sudden, I hear the loudest sound coming out of these trees and it's humongous wings flapping in the air. I had no idea what it was. And I froze, scared to death. And then it dawned on me. It was turkeys. There had to be at least a dozen turkeys up in those trees above my head. They were roosting there all night long. And when I stepped too close to their trees, they, get, they all flew off, scared me to death. Finally, when I got done being scared, I took three more steps. There's another eight to ten of them flying off, the rest of them. And I'm going, oh, I think I'm going back in the house. Well, I stuck it out. I didn't see no deer that morning, but I saw turkeys passing me. But anyway, the trees in the forest are full of birds. Think about it. And if those birds in the physical realm represent birds in the spiritual realm, then there's a really good reason why God told Josiah, Hezekiah, and others, don't just take the idol out. Cut down the groves. Why? Because the groves are the nesting place for these unclean spirits, these hateful birds. God saw what we can't see in that in the forests, in the trees, in the groves, basically you had a nest full of evil spirits. And you know, sometimes, let me say to our pastors and our church leaders, Sometimes we just get the feeling that something's not right in our churches. Something's not right. We don't know what it is. Because we don't, most, hey, I've learned as a pastor, 
I'm always going to be the last one in the church to find out who's doing something they ain't supposed to be doing. Here I am. I'm the guy that wants to help them get through this and get things right with God, but for some reason they don't want me to know about it. But I'll struggle and I'll pray and I'll fast and I'll weep and I'll say, God, what's, what's wrong with the church? What's going on here? And God is the one who can see that there's a nest of evil spirits in that church. And there may be just one or two there, but he knows how it's going to turn out. Okay? So, yes, I believe that houses, palaces, places of learning, schools, universities, religious temples, Hindu temples, synagogues, the synagogue of Satan, uh, synagogues, um, the Kaaba in Mecca, where all the Muslims walk around seven times and pray to this idol, this big cube that they've got there, that black thing there. Okay, there are spirits all over that and churches. Any church that has separated themselves from the truth of the word of God, I promise you, is going to be inhabited by devils, birds, owls, dragons, serpents. You na the Bible names it. They're going to be there. How do you get them out? Shine the light of the word of God. Amen. No, notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return where? Unto my house. Whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Notice what the Bible's saying here. Number one, he's talking about an unclean spirit. So unclean spirit, devil, uh, familiar spirit, possibly. Um, any, any kind of spirit is going to be, that is on Satan's side, is going to be unclean. When that spirit leaves a man, number one, he goes through dry places. That would be a desert, possibly a wilderness. The word wilderness simply means place where that's wild, okay? Um, and he can't find rest, so he says, I'm going to go back unto my house whence I came out. So he comes back and this body, this man's body is the reference to the house that this unclean spirit dwelt in. He finds it all cleaned and swept and garnished. And it's sort of like, it's sort of like, um, oh, I don't know, having a, a wild boar as a pet. I'm not talking about one of them little tame little pygmy pigs. I'm talking about big tusk, foul, evil, dirty, nasty smelling pig in your house. You clean up the house, disinfect it. The pig doesn't care. He's going to do whatever he wants to do in that house. He's going to tear up whatever he wants to tear up in that house. He's going to put stink wherever he wants to put stink in that house. When you have a pig, and you give them a good bath, what's the first thing they'll do? Go and roll in the mud. That's just who they are. It's their nature. That's why God called, put them in the list of unclean animals, because they're filthy. So here we have this unclean spirit. You know, maybe, maybe that spirit represents things in people's lives that are unclean. Maybe, um, maybe the shows you watch on TV 
are unclean. Maybe, um, maybe some of the books you read, they're not, they're not very nice at all, not decent. Maybe you just, maybe you just are addicted to porn. And those websites you go to and those videos you watch and those magazines you buy and all of that junk, it's unclean, it's filthy. And so I believe that with every sin, there's a spirit there. I'm not saying that Christian can be possessed. What I'm saying is there's a spirit there that draws people to certain types of uncleanness. Okay? You ever seen heroin addicts be clean people? No. No. Some of the dirtiest children you'll ever see are children whose parent or pretend parents are drug addicts. The children didn't ask for that. But that's what the devil does. He is an unclean spirit and the spirits that are on his side are unclean. So anyway, this unclean comes... Spirit comes back, finds the house swept and garnished. Then he goes out, brings seven with him. Worse than him. And now they set up house in this man's body. And the latter end, the last state of that man is worse than the first state of that. I mean, it's bad enough having one spirit in you. Now you've got seven of them. And the seven now are worse. See, the Bible's kind of telling you right there that there are levels of evil spirits. That I, that's what I believe. I believe you have some devils that are not very strong. They're not, um, oh, they're not high up on the ladder, as it were. And in some cases, it's they're easy to get rid of. But remember what Jesus said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. I think there are spirits on this level up here that just praying that they be gone isn't enough. It takes prayer and fasting to get rid of those things. And now the this person's latter state is worse than it ever was before. And think about Think about, uh, and I've seen this happen so many times, having been in church, having been in the same church pretty much most of my life, with the exception of three years in Bible college, three years where I pastored a church, and watching people supposedly come to the Lord, pray a prayer, try to live a Christian life, they may actually be given responsibilities in the church. Maybe they're on a trustee board or maybe they're deacons. But the truth of it is, when they, and I've seen it, one of my Sunday school teachers did it and it hurt my feelings. This man started coming to church, wanting to live right. After a while, he was, I got into his class. He was a Sunday school teacher of mine. I loved him to death. As a young man, young boy. Then all of a sudden he's not there anymore. Come to find out he ran off with some other woman. And he didn't just run off with one woman. He had several women. Never to be seen again. I'm telling you, the latter state of that man is worse than it was before. Second Peter is a double witness to that fact that the latter state of that person is worse than his beginning. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, notice pollutions, uncleanness, the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. That is almost exactly what Jesus said. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than 
after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. Notice that we're dealing with beasts again, animals. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. I mentioned that earlier. You clean up a pig. You can even put earrings on it, lipstick, put false eyelashes on it, put a nice pretty dress. And what's it going to do? It's going to run right back to the slop pit, roll around in it. And now the state of that pig now is worse than it was when it got started. Because at one point, it kind of cleaned up a little bit. And I'm just, I'm just telling you what I've seen in all the years that I've been in church. And I love church. I've always loved church, going to church, hearing the word of God preach, singing the songs. And as a young man, as I mentioned, now some, some of the men that I grew up under, godly men, Godly men, one of them that is very dear to me, still alive. And I just, I loved the men that God put in my life as a young boy. God was preparing me for days coming to be in the ministry. But lessons are to be learned from people who make it appear like, oh, I'm saved. I'm with, this is the road I'm staying with forever and ever and ever. And I'm never going to change. I'm never going to turn my back on God. Peter denied that he would ever deny Jesus publicly. Oh, Lord, surely that's not me. You're not talking about me. I, I would never do that. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows, you'll have denied me three times, thrice. And that is exactly what happened. The, the hog returning to its wallowing in the mire, the dog licking up its own vomit. And that disgusts us, that horrifies us. But that's the latter state of some people. People, if you're gonna, if you're gonna be saved by God and do it right, then live according to the way God's word tells us and calls us, beseeches us to live. Make our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Every day, take up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. This world is full of spirits. Spirits that hinder us and our work. Spirits that try to pull people away from the house of God and worship and Christian fellowship. Spirits that are there to offer back the old sins again. I had a friend of mine in Bible college that he was always, he always felt the urge to go back to the old life. And when I left that college, that's exactly what he did. He went back to the old life. And now his latter end, he's a homosexual. His latter end is worse than it ever was at the beginning. I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want it to happen to me. I don't want it to happen to anybody in my family. So let's take this issue of these familiar spirits. And the next, the next episode of this, we're going to concentrate specifically upon familiar spirits, both from an occult, uh, the way the, the occult world looks at them and sees them, and the way the Bible sees them. And we're going to find out the truth behind familiar spirits and why God warned so much in the scriptures to stay away from anything that had to do with familiar spirits. Okay, that's coming up next, and we've got a lot more to show you including some very, 
very famous, and I mean famous worldwide appearances of familiar spirits. You don't want to miss it, all right? God bless you. You're the reason why we do what we do. We thank you for your love and your prayers for us and your support. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.